you know, so much Manuel, and Manuel is involved in our praise band. He did a great job this morning, and also involved in our prayer ministry as well. And so, as we look at that testimony about giving, um, this is uh, the time of year we normally do a stewardship emphasis, and we do it every year. And so, you may be thinking to yourself, well, I'm here for the first time, and you can look at this in one of two ways, you know. You can look and say, well, they're just after my money. Or you can say, hey, you know, they're not afraid to preach on anything. And so I hope that you'll take the second one, all right? But this year, we're going to do it a little bit differently, and we have done it differently this month. Instead of doing a stewardship emphasis of, for three straight weeks, we're looking at four weeks of uh, really a Discover Cross Life substitute. As you know, if you uh, want to join our church, we want you to go to Discover Cross Life as a requirement, class requirement, so you'll know where the church is going as you're, you know, kind of like knowing uh, where the train's going, <clears throat> excuse me, before you get on. So instead of doing that, what we're doing here in these four weeks is that we are satisfying that class requirement. If you come to these, these services and, of course, fill out the notes, hopefully, at the end of this, which is in a couple of weeks, we're going to ask you then if you would like to join the church. And so it's that satisfaction with that. Now, this morning, last week we talked talk about the mission and the vision of the church. This morning, I want to start a two-part of this, and that is the core values of the church. Now, the core values of a church are vitally important not only to know what you're about, but also the unity of the body. I mean, there are changes going about in culture all the time. There are changes going about in churches all the time. You build buildings, and you don't build a building, and you remodel a building, or you're, you're changing music and making it louder, making it softer, and you're, and you're uh, moving classes around. There's so much change in our society. We need to know the rock-bottom beliefs of a church that will not change, that will not be compromised, that you can count on those things no matter what they are. We have seven of those values, the things that we value the most. I'm going to look at two of them today and five of them next week. And the reason I split it up that way is because I'm going to be concentrating a little bit on the stewardship uh, aspect of it this morning. There are people here that don't know about generosity. They don't know about tithing. They don't even know what that means. We have to uh, understand that and going into it. And so we're going to be looking at that a little bit this morning. But first of all, I'd like to look at two values today. One is the Word of God. That's really foundational to all we believe. And the secondly is that of stewardship of life, the Lordship of Christ in our life over the things that we possess. First of all, the Bible is the Word of God and our final authority for living. That is a foundational value that we have in the church. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, all Scripture is breathed out by God. In other words, it's inspired. This is the Greek word coming from inspiration. That's in many of your translations. What does it mean to inspire something? It means that God breathed it out. And of course, God cannot breathe error. And because of that, we believe the Bible is inspired, the actual words of the Bible, not the writers. We'll come to the writers in just a moment. But the actual words, not so much the writers were inspired of God. They are God-breathed, God-ordained by God. And of course, we believe, therefore, in inerrancy of Scripture, which means that the Bible is incapable of error because God cannot breathe and inspire error. It's also important to know that it was recorded by eyewitnesses. Listen to 2 Timothy, or excuse me, 2 Peter 1, where it says this, For we do not cleverly uh, follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when we received honor and glory from God the Father. Now, eyewitnesses, what does that mean? How valuable is that? Well, you know that in studying history, for example, if any of you here were involved, we'll say, in the Vietnam War, or even 9-11. Now, 9-11, we call it, when the terrorists attacked New York, many of you here were not born, or at least you don't remember it real well. Others will remember it extremely well. Well, we'll just say that you were involved in that. I know people that were in the tower, at least one person that was in the tower that ran out, and his life was saved. He's come to this church, and uh, um, we've had him as a guest to speak 
before. Now, he has an eyewitness account. Reporters on the scene, eyewitness accounts, they reported to us what the truth was. Now, somebody comes back 25 years later, and they, or 20-something years later, and they think to themselves, I'm going to kind of rewrite that. I'm going to look maybe down into uh, the depths of it, interview a few people maybe that were there that don't remember the facts quite well enough, and they begin to rewrite things, and they, they're just, uh, 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 just putting together the things that maybe are in their own mind. You and I both know that it's easier to get down to the truth when you have an eyewitness account than it is something 20 years or 200 years later. The biblical writers did not write all this stuff down 200, 300, 500, 1,000 years later. They wrote it down in the same century. They were eyewitnesses to everything that was going on. Now, I'm going to skip over in the interest of time, and I'm going to read in 2 Timothy 1, but I'm going to read beginning in verse 20. It says, knowing someone's own inter- knowing that this, first of all, that no prophecy, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. But listen to this. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This whole idea of being carried along is moved. And so the words of the Bible are inspired. It's not that the writers were inspired and they kind of mixed it up with the inspiration of God and and they just came up with their own their own rendition of it. They were moved by the Holy Spirit. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit, but the very words were inspired by God. Now, why is this important? Well, dear friends, when we talk about God having a personal relationship with us, we're talking about something in faith and religion that is foreign to really other religions in the world. God in most religions is so awesome, whatever uh, their, uh, their characteristic of God or whatever God they have is so awesome that you can't get to know him. In Christianity, through Jesus Christ, we know him in a personal way. Now, for God to have a relationship with us, he has to communicate with us. One of the ways, of course, he could do that is through an audible voice. He could do that by feelings in our mind, in our brain, in, in, in our body, you know, shake our body up or something. But that would only be um, really information and communication to you. Not the whole, you can't run a whole church like that. You can't run the church all throughout uh, Christendom and all throughout the world like that because we, we know that people might say different things, different places, and not only that, but if I've got a message to give you, the pastor down the road may not know that same truth. So what did God do? He gave us a written word, a document that explains to us how to have faith, the revelation of God, and the direction we all need to follow. How do we know about the love of God? The Bible tells us. How do we know the way of salvation? The Bible teaches us that. How do we know how to grow in Christ? How do we know how to please God? The Bible teaches us that. Now, that doesn't mean that that's true, necessarily, but know this, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ more it is more than ample, more than ample information that we need and evidence that we need that the Bible is the Word of God. If God wants a relationship with us, He's going to give us a written document. It needs to be perfect. It doesn't need to be something that, like a car manual, you know, you get a car manual and, and, and the, um, the guy that sells it to, us, to you says, now don't, don't pay attention to that manual because it's got errors in it. If the manual had errors in it, you wouldn't use it because you don't know where the errors are. But God gave us a perfect Bible so we can trust it in order to grow in Jesus Christ. That is proved by the fact that he rose again from the dead, which proved the the, the cross and what he did for us as he paid for our sins on the cross, which proves to us that he wouldn't die for us if he didn't want to have a relationship with us. So it all works together. And we find the word of God inspired by by God in order to give us what we need. So we must, in order to trust God, you've got to trust his word. If you don't trust his word, you're not trusting God. Really, the trust factor involved in it, the objective trust factor intertwines so closely. Well, then we ask ourselves the question, and we've been doing this for 30 plus years, and that is to say, 
What does the Bible teach? We want a decision to make. We have a decision to make. We wonder about something. We're praying about something. What does the Bible teach? In fact, there's really nothing to pray about if the Bible teaches a certain thing. What does Scripture teach? Well, with that, we go into the second um, core value of the church, and that is stewardship. And let me explain that here in just a moment. But before I do that, I want us to turn to Luke chapter 16. And in this passage, we find a parable. Now, a parable is not, sometimes you want to interpret it, oh, this means this, this means, there's only one, only one message to every single parable. God's just given us, Jesus has given us one message in this parable of the dishonest manager. And as we look at this, we understand what that is. But in breaking it down, we know that stewardship, this is a manager, this is a steward. In fact, look at, look at verse 1. He also said to his disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager. Now, in the old English, that means steward. It's where we get our word stewardship from. It's in the King James Version, I think in the New American Standard, all the older translations of the Bible, who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. As we look at this, I want us to look, well, first of all, that everything that we have given to us by God is a trust, is a stewardship. Verse 1 talks about it. God owns everything. God is the owner, and this man is the manager. Now, here's the parable that breaks down. He says, look, the owner is like God. He stands for God in this parable as in many of the parables. He's the owner. God owns everything. In fact, we can see this in Psalm 24, 1, where it says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those <clears throat> who dwell therein. And you can say, well, no, I, I think it's mine. Well, when the rich man dies and somebody asks, how much did he leave? What is the answer? He left it all. Have you ever seen a hearse pull a U-Haul? It's like the three preachers that were asked by this guy to preach his funeral. He wanted all three of them to pre have, a, have a hand in it. And he says, now, when you come to the coffin during the funeral, or you can do it on, on the viewing, whatever you'd like to do, but the casket's going to be open, and I'm going to give you $10,000 to slip into the casket so I can have some money in eternity. Well, the pastors tried to explain to him, that doesn't work that way. Your money is, he says, no, please do that. So he made them promise that he would give them the $10,000. So the first, they did all this, they had the funeral, the funeral was over, and each one of the pastors kind of wanted to know what the other one did. And so they asked the first guy, and he said, well, I put it in there, I think it's a waste, a waste of $10,000. We could have given that money to the poor, we could have done so many things with it. But I, he, he asked, I, I committed, so I did it. And the second guy, second guy said, yeah, I did too, I got really tempted to keep it. But I decided at the last moment to slip it in. They looked at the third guy and said, yeah, I did it. I wrote him a check. So <laughs> you really can't, you can't take it with you. We are stewards, our managers of what God has given us. And a steward is a manager of another person's household or possessions. Now, in this case, in verse 1, we can find this man wasting his possessions. Now, this word wasting is the same word we get in the chapter before this in Luke chapter 15 with the prodigal son. How the prodigal son took his father's his inheritance, one-third of the estate, and wasted it on riotous living. It's really a violent word. It says just wasting it on, on things that you should not be spending it upon, on sin in your life. And so he's wasted all this. And we find that the manager wasting all this, like the lost son, was now being held accountable as we all are. God owns everything and gives us possessions and gifts as a steward or a trust. This goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. Listen to this verse. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. That is, you have that, that dominion, you have the rulership over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Way back then, God was teaching them that really stewardship is lordship. Whatever is first place in your life, that's how you're going to run things. 
And we are stewards not just of our money, but we're stewards of our ta- time. Our time belongs to, to God. We're stewards of our talents, our treasures, the gospel. And in the end times, we find out that there's two different judgments. One is the great white throne judgment that many of you maybe are familiar with in Revelation, where the dead, small and great, stand before God, and they're judged for their sins. These are people that have never received Christ into their heart. There's another judgment. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. And that is where Christians appear before God in the final accountability, the final judgment in a different type of judgment. It's an evaluation, and it's going to be based on rewards. And here's going to be the question, only question, what did you do with what I gave you to do with? What did you do with your time? What did you do with your talents? Did you make your treasures count, or did you waste them away? We find that God even gives us the ability to make money. Now, I know that some of you are thinking to yourself, yeah, but pastor, I'm more educated than the next guy. I paid for my education. I paid for the years, and I prepared, and I'm making more money. I deserve more money, and I, I need to keep more money. Another would say, well, I'm not maybe as smart, but I work, or educated, but I work so much harder. Man, there's lazy people around. That's different. No, God says, I give you the ability to make wealth. I gave you the ambition. I gave you the ability to work. I gave you the opportunity for the education. You took advantage of it, but I gave you every single ability that you have. It says in Deuteronomy 8.18, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to make wealth. Now, with this wealth, it stands to reason. If I'm not the owner, I'm the manager, then I need to take my lead from the owner on what I need to do with my time, talent, and treasure. For example, some of you are financial planners. That's, your, that's how you make a living. And others are hiring a financial manager. So you say you hire someone here in the church, and they're your financial manager, and that you just say, look, there's, there's certain things I don't want to support. And so you list them, you know, maybe it's pornography or gambling or something on the internet, and you say, I don't want to support those things. And it turns out, after a year, that's exactly what he's been doing. He's been buying stock and things that you, you, have, you, you don't want to support at all. And maybe he's making you some money, maybe he's losing the money. But the point is, he looks at you and says, no, when you handed your money over to me, it became mine to do whatever I wanted to do with. No, no financial planner is going to be that way. He has to take his lead from the owner. If God owns everything, I need to ask him the question, God, what do you want me to do with your money? You see, we have three fallacies about giving. One is that it's my money, and I hope that we've settled that issue. Secondly, when I give, I give to the church. And thirdly, when I give, I have more to lose than I have to gain. Well, more to lose than you have to gain, you see, it's not only a trust, but everything we have is also a test, a test of faith. Anything you do new in the Christian life, any step of faith, any step that you take is always a step into the unknown. It's always a step of faith. So everything that we have is a test as well. Now, this man have been robbing the master. We can find kind of a a lead-in set of verses in the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament before the 400-year, what we call an intertestamental period, right in between the Old and New Testament. The next prophet on the scene besides Malachi would be John the Baptist. So Malachi, going through a time where Israel was really being blessed, and they were misusing the funds of God. In matter of fact, God always required them to give the best, the first fruits, the best. For example, they were going to have a lamb, and the lamb had to be perfect. The one they sacrificed had to be perfect. The wool was perfect. The eyes were perfect. uh, You know, the, the skin, everything was the best of the flock. Well, in Malachi's day, they were giving God the leftovers, and they would say, look, you know, we've got all these great sheep that we can sell, and and nurture. This one over here is pussing at the eyes. It's sick. It's diseased. Let's give that to the Lord. We, you know, it doesn't matter. We're going to burn it anyway. And God said that is detestable before the Lord. It is giving God the leftovers. A more contemporary illustration of this. I was reading a book 
recently, in fact, this, this past week, by um, Andrew McNair about, on giving. And he said that when he was dating his wife, he would, uh, every Friday, he would go into her workplace and take her roses, a different amount maybe each time, but roses, and uh, she would just, you know, beam all over her work, the fellow workers around would gather around, what a great boyfriend you have. Man, he's just great. And she would say, oh, my hero, and, you know, his inf inflation of his ego was so, so large, you couldn't get in an elevator, you know, get his head in the eleva elevator when he left. But then she came to his place of work, and she walked up to the receptionist, told her who she wanted to see, and she noticed some roses there on the table. And she said, oh, what are these roses for? And she said, well, we give a rose to every person, every lady that comes in to visit because, you know, money, it's only money and, hey, you've got to stop and smell the roses. You know, that's what we say. And so about that time, her boyfriend walks in. She asked him, said, yeah, yeah, we give one to everyone. She said, well, they look familiar to me. And he said, yeah, whatever's left over at the end of the week, I put together and bring to you. And somehow they got married anyway. I don't know how that worked out for him. But what, what, hey, this was, she said, hey, these roses, I appreciate you getting me the roses. But these roses were originally meant for someone else and not me. And I'm just getting whatever's left over. This was the sin of Malachi's day. So here's what it said in the Bible. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? He says, in tithes and offerings or contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. Only place in the Bible that we're ever challenged to put God to the test. He says, put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until it overflows. So we're asked the question, how much is enough? How much should we start with? How much should we end with? You know, here's, here's the problem sometimes in my own Christian life. I don't know how much time to put into serving God. It never tells me in the Bible. You don't know that. I mean, you know, that's, that's for me as a, as a minister, but even as a layperson, you don't know. Is it, is it two hours a week? Is it five hours a week? You don't know. But the Bible does tell us how much that we're to give. It says a tithe is the beginning place. Now, in the Old Testament, you were cursed with a curse if you didn't do it. That was, that was the, kind of the ceiling. That was the goal. You gave that much, or God was very, very displeased. In the New Testament, we live by grace. We find that the, the tithe is then the floor and not the ceiling. Now, what does this word mean? Because some people will say, well, I tithe 5%, I tithe 6%. The word tithe means a tenth portion. And so it was 10%. You say, well, man, that's a lot of money. Uh, there's no question, sometimes it really can be. My... Uh, my grandfather lived up in uh, North Georgia, was a sharecropper. And a sharecropper, basically, you would occupy someone else's land, you would farm the land, and then you would split the profits. And that's what he did. And so if you think, well, we're, we're kind of sharecroppers with God. He's the owner, we're the stewards, we manage everything. And so how much should we give him in return? Well, if you come, if you're coming from that background, of a sharecropper, you would say, well, what about 50%? God, can I, can I keep 50? Well, no, I, I didn't. God says, I didn't have that in mind. Well, what about 40 then? He says, no, go the other way. You mean 60? Keep going. 70? I, I get to keep 70%. You no, know, keep going. 80%. Finally, 90%. 90%. I get to keep 90% and you own everything? See, it depends on the perspective involved. Now, God says that he first told Abraham about tithing, and Abraham began to do that. It was incorporated years, years, decades later into the law of Moses. And then finally, in the New Testament, Jesus said this, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done 
without neglecting the others. You see, in the New Testament, it's not just a matter of legalistically giving your 10%. It's doing it from the heart because other people need it. The church needs it to minister to other people. You need to do it and also in your own life. We'll come to that in just a moment. But why 10%? Why not 7%? Why not 15%, 20%? Well, the number 10 in the Bible is the number of completeness. See, there's numerology in the Bible. There's books written about the numerology in the Bible. Every number stands for something, it seems like. Well, the number three is the number for God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The number six is the number for man. That's why you have in the book of Revelation, 666 was the number of the, is the number of the Antichrist. The number seven is the perfect number. The number 10 is the number of completeness. So every time I give, and every time in the Old Testament they gave, every time in the New Testament they gave, every time I give now, I'm reminded everything that I have completely belongs to God. It's a reminder. It's also a cure for idolatry. You see, in every crowd like this, and I don't know who you might be, but in every crowd like this or watching uh, maybe by television or the internet at home, there are people that are thinking to themselves, I can't give up my money. So what tithing does for us, it's a cure for idolatry. Now, we've talked about this so many times. Anything you put on the throne of God or the throne of your life, whether it's God or something else, becomes the God of your life. So you choose the God of your life. And if you're saying, hey, look, you know, I'm not coming back to church because I've got to give. He's making me feel guilty about giving. And I, I, I just, I'm not going to give anything like that. And I'm not going to read the Bible anymore because of that. And I'm just going to walk away from God. And I've had somebody. I had, a, in my last church, a guy came out after hearing a sermon on money for the first time. Been a Christian less than a year. He said, man, I bet you that was a tough message to preach. And I said, yeah, I, I guess. He left never came back. I knocked on his door, rang his doorbell. He was eating at the table. He looked out, saw who it was, did not answer the door. You have people that will see me on the street and say, well, I, you know, I quit going to your church because all you do is preach on money. Well, how often do they come? You know, I do this once a year, you know, so I don't know. Something is on the throne of their life. It's not God. It's either money or something that money can buy in their life. It's a cure for our idolatry. The only way you're going to get God on the throne is to kick the other God off the throne. And that's what it does. In fact, the purpose of tithing, the Bible says, the purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your life. Well, we look at this and we understand that we have 10% to give. Where do you give it? We know how much. Now, how, where, where, what does the Bible teach where you give it? Well, in Malachi 3.10 that we read just a few moments ago, it says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so there will be meat in my house, food in my house. Now, the New Testament storehouse is the church. I don't think that's real debatable. It is the church where you get fed, where we disciple other people so we can send them out. And yes, a lot of the, the funds are spent here, but they're spent here to disciple you. They're spent here so you can be that attraction ministry to the rest of the world, the window dressing, when people look at your life and see how you're handling adversity, how you're going through tough times, how you can have joy in your life, how you are getting answers to prayer, how you will walk with God through temptation. They are inspired to listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we have that going on, and it's to provide for the ministry of the church. Now, I know that some people say, well, I give 2%. To the, I had a guy like this. Uh, he said, I, I'm confused. I give 2% here and 2% there and 1%. And finally, whatever's left over, I give to the church. And, but you're saying the Bible teaches that the whole 10% belongs to the storehouse. And anything I give above that to other missions and like to our Cross Life Christian Academy is over and above the tithe. Yes, that's what we're teaching. Whoa, now you're talking about more money. But again, you know, you're, we're sharecroppers. And the Bible says, look, 10% is the requirement, but we live on grace, and grace is always greater than the law. And so to be generous, I want to give more than the tithe. And so this year, we're asking you to give a certain percent above the 10% to Cross Life Christian Academy to get us started, because we're about to teach 
uh, children, the, um, the Christian worldview. We're about to disciple them in a really more deliberate way in the Lord. We're not sending them off somewhere else to be somebody else to teach them. We're, we're teaching them here as a church. We have certain expenses to get started that we were not expecting because our buildings have to be renovated and the rooms that we're going to be using, as you saw just a few moments ago. So there's a need there, and we're going to challenge you. If you want to be involved in the school, and if you want to be involved in supporting that school, then instead of maybe giving a one-time gift, but you can do that, it's just simply one, two, three percent. Some people in times past, we did this about 10 years ago, and they gave five percent. And so we challenge you to do that over and above. Now, where do we give? We give here to the church and not designate it. The tithe is not designated. It's holy, Leviticus says in, verse, in chapter 27. It's holy to the Lord. When do, we, when do we give it? We give it first. And I know that some people may say, well, I've tried that before. I, I had a couple that came to me and said, look, we, we're trying to tithe, and it's just not working out. And I said, well, how, do, how are you doing it? And they said, well, we pay our, all our bills, and then we pay for the food, and we pay for the gas, and we pay for everything else, and whatever the kids need, and whatever's left over, we expect 10% to be left over to give to, to God, and, and very seldom is the 10% there. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. And I said, that's not the order that we give. The order that we give is, God, we give it by faith to you first. Then we trust you with the other 90% to stretch out over all of my needs. That's where the step of faith would come from. And so we, we do this and we say to ourselves, well, instead of giving, giving God what's left over, we give by faith up front. So we know that everything we have is a trust, everything we have is a test, but also everything we have that God gives us is a tool. It's a tool for ministry, for others. It's a tool for you. First of all, it's a tool for ministry. You know, in the Church of England, for example, the Church of England is supported by England. And what they have, they don't have the separation of church and state that we do. And so the church is not only supported by tithes and offerings, but it's also supported by the state. Now, no church in America is supported by the state. Now, some churches would have endowments, and they live off part of the, the money they live off is, is, is interest off the endowments. We don't have that. Everything that we do as ministry in this church is done by the giving of you. And last year, we met budget, by the way. We made it by $9,000. Now, you think about that for just a moment. On this campus, $6.7 million, and we made it by $9,000. Now, talk about God providing, but also talking about you making a difference right? Making a difference. Now, all we have, now we say, well, what do we spend it on? Well, $35,000 a month is spent toward utilities. There's building materials. There's missions. There's camps. Somebody says, oh no, I pay for my own camp. We, we pay for our camp. No, you, you really don't pay for all of it. Everything that we do here is supplemented by the budget. So the reason why the camp price is down where it is, is because we have budgeted money going to pay for that camp. Then there's salaries. You say, well, there's, my, there, there's your problem right there. You don't want to pay salaries. So you don't want to pay my salary. Man, that hurts my feelings so bad. I'm going to take your name. No, I'm just kidding. No, um, we, we do have that. And one of the reasons why we have that, we have to have people leading the ministries so we can't have the camp, so we can have vacation Bible school, so we can't have people discipled and other people wanted Jesus Christ. We just need that to build you up as the body of Christ. That's a necessity. So we have all these things. And you think, well, I want to know where my money's going. Well, let me just say this. We've already established it's not your money, all right? But also, let me say this. And I, I say this, I think, as an educated guess, but very educated, I think. And that is this. We handle our finances better here at the church than you do probably at home. My wife can tell you we're better at church than, than I am at home. My wife can tell you that. It's probably the same with you. I mean, how many of you here have a yearly audit? Everything goes for something. Everything's important. 
Everything has a certain amount. We just don't throw money out there and say, well, let's just be fair to everybody, give everybody the same amount. No, everything beforehand has a designated way, place for it to go for the coming year. We watch it carefully, carefully. And so we operate our budget in a responsible manner, and we look at the, the results, 5,500 baptisms over the last 30 years, 130 people plus called to ministry. We've been involved in the community 30 different occasions this past year. We secured Oviedo schools in three, two different high schools and the, the elementary school across the street. We helped start the Boys and Girls Club, probably what I've been told, the biggest financial contribution to getting that, thing, to that uh, ministry started. And so it's a blessing to others, but it's also a blessing to you. You know, I'm, I'm estimating that about 60% of our regular attenders tithe. You say, my goodness, that's huge. That's, that's so big. That's so many. Pastor, are you not satisfied? When are you ever going to be satisfied? Well, let me ask you this. If you had 10 kids, I know I just scared the rest of you to death. You know, even flashes of horror going across your brain. But if you had 10 kids and six of them were blessed, four of them were not, would you be satisfied? I want all of you to be blessed. And look what the Bible tells us. The Bible sa says right here in this passage, he says, I'll skip to verse 11, if then you have been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, talking about temporary stuff, who will entrust to you true riches if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Listen to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6. Give and it be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you again. He's simply saying, you're generous. He even says this in Proverbs. If you be generous with others, God will be generous to you. And you say, well, that's kind of a health and wealth gospel. That's not what I'm preaching if you just give to get something back, God is not honored by that. But you give out of a heart of love. You give because you love God and you want to be obedient to him. Because if you love him, Jesus said, keep my commandments. You, you want to do that. You look at the lives of others that don't know Jesus. You want them to know Jesus Christ. You see the lives of others growing up and leaving church. You don't want that. You want to pour into their life. You love them. When you do that, on the side, God's going to bless you financially. Now, it just makes sense, just for a moment, if I could just pause for a moment. If you had a sales force and you had someone that was just hitting home runs, I mean, you could trust that person, no matter what client you gave them, they were going to serve that client. And then others, well, you had a few others that were pretty good. Then you had others that were just sort of feeling, filling a space. They spent more time maybe excusing themselves for not making money than, than making money. And you had a great client coming in. Who are you going to give that to? You're going to give it to the one that you trust the most. Listen, if, if you and I are a conduit to God, he's given us money, then instead of hoarding it all, we're giving it to other people. We are generous with other people. And he's wanting to get the money out to a lot of different people and he's wanting to bless you to do it. He's going to give it to the person who's not going to hoard it, but is going to give it. God blesses you, not just as a reward. That, those rewards are more going to come toward heaven. He's going to bless you because he's a good business. He has a good business mind and knows what he wants to accomplish. Well, it's a blessing to others. It's a blessing to you. It's a blessing in the fact you can be fulfilled, knowing you're making a difference in life. Here's, the <coughs> Here's what the parable's teaching. One thing it's teaching, one thing, and here it is. We have a short amount of opportunity, short amount of time to use our gifts, our time, talent, treasures, our gifts to get people into heaven. Winning friends. He says, you're going to win friends. He says, in verse 9, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. He's saying, look, we've got this, this man had a short opportunity, a brief time 
that he could help other people that would help him. Jesus is saying, you have a short amount of time to make a difference in this world for Jesus Christ. And when it's done, it's done. Are we going to take that opportunity? Are we going to take that other God off the throne and put God on the throne? We'll be fulfilled. We'll be free from that other God in our life. So we ask ourselves, what does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches more about money than it does about love, joy, and peace all put together. The Bible teaches us it's not our own money, it's God's. When we give, we give to God and others. You cannot outgive God. You have much more to gain and really nothing to lose. Can you trust him? He says, put me to the test. And I will pour out, open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Now, what about us today? You know, I'll just close with this. Um, I remember when I was a student at the University of Georgia and um, I would tithe. I've I've heard messages on tithing. And I would tithe uh, when I remember to get my checkbook. You know, I'd go to church. Back then, you didn't have a realm account so you can just go online and give. You, you had to bring money. You had to bring a check. Oh, I forgot it today. Man, I, I forgot it. I never made it up. And I just kept giving at the end of the year, 5 6% maybe. And one series of messages in January, I think it actually was in September, Bill Ricketts, my pastor at Prince Avenue Baptist Church, preached a three-part series of messages on stewardship. He did that every year. That's where I got it, you know? And a three-part message. And I thought to myself at first, man, he's going to preach on money three weeks in a row? But the end of it, he pulled out a commitment card. And it, we just say it looks something like this. And he said, I want you to take this commitment card, and I want you to make a commitment to the Lord, not just in your mind, but actually down on paper. And I knew, I knew, if I filled out that card, I was going to tithe all year long. I was going to make up for it. I was good to my word. I was, that's exactly what I was going to do. And so I prayed about it, which, you know, I don't know why I prayed about it. It was pretty obvious what God wanted me to do. I filled out the card. I started tithing on a regular, consistent basis. End of the year, I was given 10% or more and never looked back. Been tithing ever since. My wife and I, since we got married, we have been tithing and giving above the tithe to something every year. I never looked back because why? I made the commitment. You say, well, why do you do the commitment card? Listen, I know pastors all the time. They talk to me about giving. What, what is the secret to you getting people to tithe? And I said, well, I preach on it. He said, well, we do that. I do that. So do you do a commitment card? Well, no. I don't want to put people off. Well, we commit to buying a house. We commit to buying a car. We commit to marriage. There's a lot of things we commit to. Why can't we just simply commit to God? And I, I would challenge you in this way. Some people might say, well, wow, it sounds like you're hung up on money. That's not really the question. The bigger question is, all right, the bigger question is, why can't you just simply trust your finances to God? Why can't you do that? And so what I want us to do right now, I want you to take the, this card. It's the end of your row. Now, if you don't take the card, you say, oh, I don't want to participate I'm a guest or whatever and that's fine but if you don't take that stack of cards with the envelopes and pass them down the road nobody on your road is going to get one that's the only place they are so you're going to have to cooperate with us a little bit all right and so you look down and and see these pink cards and uh, it's on your screen right there nice attractive card and if you would pass those down to the people next to you I just kind of like to explain a little bit as we close what we're doing here all right and so if you'll do that I would uh, appreciate it. And so would your neighbor, I think. All right? And so as we're doing that, here's here's what the card says. Because I believe in the ministry of my church and want to make a personal difference, I will take a step of faith to begin tithing. And that's for those who have either never started or you started out and maybe you were doing what I said, you know, making maybe the last part of it, you're giving, whatever. You never really filled out a card, those kind of things. You're going to begin tithing. Secondly, continue tithing. Thirdly, tithe and give an additional blank percent. It could be one, 
2% or more to the school just for this year, over and above the tithe to the school for this year. And then lastly, pray for the ministry of Cross Life Church. I think all of us could put a, a check there. I estimate my con contribution, total contribution to be this. And the reason we do that, it helps you because it's going to be on your uh, realm account. Uh, on, and some of you uh, maybe not know what that is. We need to explain that a little bit better. But it's an app that we have for your convenience of giving on the phone. And um, you can go to that and, and look at what your pledge or commitment was for the year. So it helps you. But it also helps our stewardship committee. We have to let go of some money early for camps and all, all the stuff we're doing during the summer and next fall. And it kind of gives us a, a way of saying, okay, we know this is going to happen because we, we know this much money at least is coming in. So you're going to really help us. If you're a commission sales, you don't know what it is, then you have to leave that blank. I know that. Or you can estimate it. But if you would do that and then put the information down on the bottom, uh, that would help us, but it would really help you. And that's what we want to do. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you just maybe turn the card down in your lap, I'd like to pray for you. God, we come to you in prayer in the name of Jesus, and I thank you, Lord, for everything that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for meeting our, our needs last year and every year. And uh, God, we, we're praying that you're going to meet them again this year. No matter how close they are, that you would just simply meet the need of the hour. And God, I pray that you would lay on everybody's heart just a release in their heart of the God that maybe is on the throne. And just simply say, God, if this is your word and this is true, then I want to obey you today. Beginning today, I want to obey you. In Jesus' name, with heads bowed and eyes closed, you continue to pray as you feel led. Start, you can fill out the card, and we'll receive them in just a moment. I'll give you a few moments to do that.